Grand Rising, welcome to uh, Conversations on Art uh, with myself, Grant Usha, with Annie, a textile artist and painter, Jane, a mosaic artist, and today's guest, we have uh, Thomas, who's in Austria. Hi, everybody. Hi. Hi. So last week we started with um, this Jane, Annie and I just having a simple chat about art and what we do, and it went really well. So we thought this week we'd invite our guest, Thomas. Yeah, so Thomas, could you tell us a bit about your painting and your pottery, please? Um, yes, well, I've been painting most of my life, actually. But uh, pottery is something that I've done only recently as a kind of, well, I've, I've tried a lot of different things. It's not just that. I've, before that, I've done some woodworking, jewelry, because I studied design in Denmark and I tried different crafts. And I kind of had like a, an art education there for, well, academic drawing a little bit, but I also went into human, drawing the human figure afterwards, just in my own time. And then somehow I ended up trying pottery last year. <clears throat> I did an internship with a ceramic artist in Latvia. But then Corona started and I had to leave prematurely. And I wasn't so sure if pottery was going to be my thing I still don't know it's it's not something um, I think it requires some dedication and also well either dedication or investment and I don't have a studio available to me right now and otherwise you kind of have to find a place where you can do work and well I dabbled a bit in it I wouldn't say that I'm a potter <laughs> um, but I also do daily writings and kind of that's what I enjoy most or that's I think where I get most of my inspiration for all the other things from anything, any kind of project that's happening. And what I do is I just write. <laughs> and um, sometimes it turns into poetry. Sometimes it's like a diary. Sometimes it's like a sometimes I end up drawing something, you know, it's just kind of free and spontaneous. But I noticed that that is something that where the reason I enjoy writing as a creative tool, and it doesn't mean that I'm going to write a book, I, I have considered it, maybe it will happen, but or that I will be a writer, but I consider it a good creative tool to, to do every day for myself, because um, it's like a, it's like a bullshit net. Also, I can I can write down all my bullshit right away, and then see it, and then eventually it, it turns into something else. Like it, I become more. Um, it's like a shift. It's like a meditation in a way. Like that, I I write all my worries sometimes, and then it turns into. Um, there's just silence and from that it's like going fishing you know then it, something happens and it's just I'm watching and then no longer involved with uh, the, what, what's happening I'm just watching as the writing is happening as as the pen is creating things on a page and suddenly it just takes a life of, of its own and then I that kind of attitude, I think, helps me in anything else that I do. It could be pottery or painting or... Because it's a kind of way of seeing. And with painting especially, um, I've taken up oil painting recently. I've usually just been drawing and, and with markers and pencils and, and pastels, things like that, but now I've taken up oil. And yeah, it's continuously a process where I'm observing and 
kind of making way for things to happen. I think that was the most, that's the most challenging thing for me to give up control and to just kind of um, see every time, like never come to a conclusion about what's happening. Always kind of see it's there, something is offered, but then I, I enjoy it, but then I already like, I, I, I'm not gonna dwell on that for long and go, go on. So that's like a kind of a flow. Well, okay. <laughs> That's my two cents. <laughs> Annie, have you been, um, so what kind of painting do you do, Annie? Um, I don't come from an academic background with my paintings. So um, as I said to yourself and Jane before, and uh, Thomas doesn't know this, I did my um, art and design uh, quite late in life so I was about 25 and I didn't have any academic tutoring at all I from that chose textiles and my specialism was printed textiles so you needed to paint and it really stressed me because everybody had come from uh, doing A levels O levels and had learned techniques and already had some substantial learning so we had a fantastic visiting tutor that came in and she um really worked on designing flooring and she was working for somebody called Janet Street Porter. I know Jane and uh, Brian will know that. I don't know if you will know Thomas, she's like a journalist, uh, quite a, a well-known journalist. So she was working on her floor and she came in to tutor us and she was the one that said, listen, just look at color and form and that's it. And it re that really helped me. So anyway, I went on with my, um, really self-taught so I don't have any academia as in that and then I got into textiles um printing textiles and I really became more involved with painting a lot more semi-abstract and I really enjoyed doing that but I also like uh combining the textiles within the art um and wanting to go back now to doing weaving so Although I have been taught um, techniques in printing, techniques in um, weaving, I'm not, uh, you know, an established weaver or established printed textile. I've just used what I found and from what I already have um, within me. So a lot of it is just self-taught. And listening to Thomas speak, a lot of that resonated with me in writing things down because I keep um, a loose journal and I write a lot of things again that as he said these are things that come to your mind and it's good to see them on paper and I think just have it come out of you because then you can reflect back with it and I guess not being attached to it allows whatever is coming through you to just come through so what I got from what you said Thomas is that you're just allowing whatever inspiration is coming through you whatever it is you're actually allowing it and not having a pre-conclusion this is what my end is and I think that's a very commendable because I can always sometimes have yes my product is going to be like this you know I have an end result and sometimes it's good not to be um, attached, attached to what, because that can uh, constrain you from, you know, expressing more. So, yeah, that really, that really, you know, that I can understand that in writing and just writing for writing. Does it help? Say, to... That was actually Brian who um, kind of put me a little, gave me the, that kind of hint with the writing and to, to, to not let anything below the surface, let any, anything come up. But he, he passed that one on to me. So I'm very grateful for that. It really does. <laughs> oh, yeah. That's a great, I think that's a great tip. Agreed. And also, I think sometimes you you have these ideas, 
and you think you'll always remember them. And so writing them down by writing them down and making them um, sort of real as such in the real world from that other ideas come and you go back to it and more ideas spring from that and um, and you sort of capture a time, don't you? You capture a creativity at that time that I think you'd lose if you just keep it in your head. So just, yeah, I'm not quite sure what I'm trying to say. <laughs> it almost seems like you, it, it's like a declutter as well. So if you have it and you have it written, if you forget about it, it's okay because there will be a time when you will come across it and it'll be like, oh, wow, yeah. That's, yeah, I remember, and I've done that loads of times. So yeah, we were always encouraged, write your, um, uh, whatever inspiration comes to your ideas, you know, get them down just so that, you know, because sometimes when something is so fresh in your mind, you think you're gonna remember it. And it just goes, doesn't it? It's Sometimes it's fleeting. Um, and by writing it down, it can grow into something much, much more. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Have you found that you've written something down and you look back at it um, later on and it's taken you into kind of a new direction? You forgot the idea you had, you look at it in six months and you think, wow, I can do something with that. Because you're in a different place then, aren't you? And you see those words in a different way or they resonate because of something that might have happened around the six months later or um, it sparks an idea that's completely different because of all the influences you've had at a specific late, later on I think it's interesting what you were what you're saying about um, letting it letting the art take you where it goes and it suddenly struck me sitting there because I've been working in mosaics for a while and again um, I'm self-taught because um, a neighbour used to be a mosaic artist and uh, I kind of worked um, with her and um, just learnt as, as I went along um, and what I've been doing recently is I've been working on portraits within mosaics and and what I realized when you were talking is actually I can't allow it to take me where um where I want it to go because it's very specific and um and it sort of jolted something in me that I need to get back to doing something where doing some art where it just takes you where you want it to go um yeah and I suppose I did that with some, I was talking about some embroidery over the summer and, and that was lovely, sort of just adding, adding to these motifs on a daily basis. But I, did, I did some, Thomas, um, an, an embroidery over the summer with motifs that represented our experience of um, this lockdown period. And um, it started off just being a couple of motifs and it just grew and so, by the end of the year, this had kind of, it had become a story of 2020. And, and I suppose I've forgotten that. I've only just remembered that now, that, the, that lovely feeling of just letting something take you where it will go and um, representing something at a time, a moment in time. Um, yeah, yeah. So, so, so that's what I love about art and creativity is it represents your state of mind, your, uh, you know, what, what, you're, what you're going through and you can just get lost, lost in it. Um, but then again, and, I, and you were talking about the pottery and um, we have a show here called the Great Pottery Throwdown and I was thinking I'd love to get a, a wheel and I'd love to, to do that. And one of the challenges last night or 
was making something with your eyes closed. So all you're doing on the wheel is feeling and feeling the shape. Um, but I know what you're saying, you're sort of um, confined by the space around you and what. <laughs> well, also, if you want to finish a piece, um, it's, I mean, I've worked in this kind of production of tableware pottery. It wasn't really art. It, I mean, it's, it's, it's always an art, but it, it was for handmade plates and cups for restaurants and other cu customers that have this, um, well, they have specific needs sometimes. And we also made vases and also hand building, you know, not only with a wheel, but you can hand, hand build the vases with coiling and things like that. But then you need, you need, a studio because so I can't just if I want to really make a pottery from beginning to end I need a kiln to yeah. fire the pots and that's already a big investment and I need a place where I can put on the glazes I need shelves where I put the, the pottery to dry and the sink needs to you know all these little things they add up and then you have a studio I mean from what I from the way I experience pottery but maybe there, there must be some simple ways for sure it's just that if if you I wanted I also thought so often about having a wheel at home, yeah. just because it's such a beautiful yeah thing to do. <laughs> but then if I want to finish a piece, yeah, it'll be tricky to yeah. then store put it somewhere where it won't break on the way when I travel somewhere to, to get it fired, and then you have to fire it not just once, fire it twice or three times sometimes. So. Mm -hmm. It's, yeah, <laughs> that's why it's a... Uh... I suppose maybe the, the way to go, because I was thinking about this a lot recently, is maybe finding collectives of, of people who want to do the same thing um, and finding that space. But like you say, it's that initial setup, isn't it, with the materials and everything that's in, involved with that. Um, you kind of just want to get your hands in straight away, don't you? It's it's it, yeah it's, yeah true. have you ever done pottery Annie no I mean just you know secondary school which was no but I saw uh, some of Thomas's uh, stuff and they were, were beautiful Thomas mm. what um, I saw the cups and the plates they were stunning I mean they're pieces of art for me they were pieces of art but I can I think I can understand that it's different when you work for yourself than when you're working to somebody else's spec of what they want. But I was gonna say here where I live, they ha we have a college and they run uh, pottery classes. And a lot of the people don't do it for the class, they just pay to use the facilities. So obviously if somebody new's joining then they're just going to be showing them but a lot of them just carry it on it's just like a roll on and I think a lot of uh the people that do it do it so that they can as you've just explained you know you need to fire it you need to have a place to keep it and I think for them that is where um it works monetary wise you know so I don't know if that might be I don't know um something for you to look at you know when we're out of this I don't know covid sort of thing um it, it could be a possibility for you to use as an option maybe i already know what i if i want to go on with pottery i'm moving soon to latvia because i in the meantime i've also met my love in latvia while i was doing this and we've come engaged oh, and so now and now yes Congrats. wonderful thank you and so if I go back to Latvia, well, I can always visit my friend who has the studio with yeah. the pottery and she will always let me use the facilities. It's just that I have to drive a long way, but that's, that's yeah, maybe on the weekends. <laughs> that sounds cool. Yeah. And is that where yeah. do you want to kind of become a potter? Is that, is that where you see your, your, your art taking you? Or would you just like to do every, you know, the uh, I, painting as well. I still want to do everything. Yeah. That's my problem, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I said this to Brian the other day, you know, I don't want to do one thing. I want to do many things. There's so many 
you know, <laughs> things. I don't want to just do that. I want to do this and I want to do this and that. So how do you? I don't know. Is it just at this moment, then Thomas, this is what I am. And then tomorrow, Thomas can be this or Jane can be this. I can be this. You know, is it just that? You know, because I think that could really play on us because we're so taught, you know, yes, you should be, even at uni, specialised, you need to choose one. But what if I yeah, want to do all three of them? You know, they, all, really they all work together, actually, don't they? They all, they all um, tie into one another. They all use the same skills, um, but just with different materials, don't they? Absolutely. I mean, it's what you were saying um, Thomas about um, doing the drawing, going to school and doing the drawing. I, I mentioned last time that we'd spent, uh, um, I'd spent some time um, do doing a portrait, learning how to draw and learning how to draw the, the traditional way. The, 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 um, and that really gave me um, a foundation for everything not necessarily just portraits but just understanding how to look at shape and form in the basic way um, and it's and it all ties into everything whatever you're doing I think it all it, it, it's interconnected isn't it what it's just the medium you're working in you're using the same principles. It's just learning a slightly different skill, isn't it? And I, th I think you're right, we're all pigeonholed, aren't we? But actually, why shouldn't we be able to work in any medium? I saw an exhibition by Grayson Perry and I had never heard of him before. And this was maybe 2011, 2012, and he had an exhibition at the British Museum. And a very good friend of mine, said come along let's go and see and I was blown away because he does ceramics yeah. but he did these fantastic uh, woven tapestries and that was like wow this is you know he did these metal sculptures that had been created and it was like wow why should we be as artists pigeonholed as you know I see smiling Thomas it's a hundred percent that you know he had the idea okay so he couldn't weave so he took it to these huge industrial weavers up north because we had a very big uh, weaving industry uh, decades ago now. Um, and they, they came up and he gave a lot of praise to these women. There was a program to go along with it, but it was absolutely stunning. There's no reason why any of us should be pigeonholed. And having seen um, an exhibition with Picasso. I, I couldn't believe that this man had done so many different techniques. It was amazing. I just thought he did these uh, blue people, you know, these blue images of uh, figures. And I couldn't believe how broad, how broad and how talented he really was. I thought, yeah, none of us should be pigeoned mm -hmm. into, you know, uh, one thing because art is everything. I think pigeonholing is just simply not true. It would it wouldn't be true because I I, I can be anything at any time at any moment. As as a child, one day I was Crocodile Dundee, the next day I was uh, a Power Ranger, and then I was this and that and. and <laughs> schooling has a lot to do with that where we're sort of um you know pushed in to go somewhere you know put yourself somewhere it's like playing musical chairs and we feel that when the music stops we need to be seated somewhere you know I don't want to be sat and fall on the floor so it's a way of putting you somewhere it's also I I it's say, a little you... sorry no no go ahead sorry just the, there's so many things that seem to be expected of us because people want to know what's going on. There's like, you have to check in and say, what have you done? What have you, it's not about, then, then it's about like, um, I think for an artist, especially, it's very strange because sometimes you can go for a long time and not really have a finished product. 
but the finished product will be something that then encapsulates everything that you've been experiencing maybe in a whole year. All the things that were happening to you or what you've been learning and new ways of seeing and discovering. And then it's strange when, when, when it's then treated like a kind of weekly report thing. When my, when my, when my fiance, she asks me, did you work today? And you and I'm feeling like, you know, I'm always at work somehow. It's, it, it doesn't matter if I'm sitting down and watching my dog playing in the field, it, something may come at that moment that will then develop into something else. And of course, sometimes you sit down and do things like managing things. But I guess that we just think, it's the way we think, I think, always, that just gets in, in the way or that it's useful, but it shouldn't be an obstacle, I think. And it often becomes an obstacle or it then we crystallize because we need to, we feel a need to settle into something and then it can become mechanical also, I think. And that's something I'm, a, that's my biggest fear actually. <laughs> That, that, uh, that it's yeah that it's not enjoying the process but it's yeah. thinking too much about where you the the end as opposed to just enjoying the process to to get there yeah and sometimes it's nice just to um enjoy the process and stop when you think oh actually this is right to stop here and feel comfortable about stopping <laughs> rather than just keep going to find some elusive perfection um I, I was in a group and we we, we we were in a still life group and it was really a, a social group and and it went on for about a year and and this picture it was oil painting and um it was once a week and we were there so long just enjoying the process that what started off as an autumnal still life ended up being a spring, <laughs> ended up with sp <laughs> spring buds in it. But, and there was a point where you sort of didn't want it to end, but you kind of knew it had to <laughs> because it couldn't go any further, but it was just enjoying where, where it went. <laughs> And I'd love mm. to do more of that, actually. It was what you said earlier that's kind of inspired me. Yeah. It's wonderful, you know, when we hear each other talk about what we're doing and um, we become inspired. I mean, Annie and I have uh, talks all the time about what we're doing, music or ideas and creativities. And, um, you know, Annie, Annie, could, could you talk about, you know, um, some of the breakthroughs we've been having over the last two weeks with the character and how we've gone through that? Yeah, we've had, um, so I'm doing, uh, the, or working with uh, Brian with his illustrations for his book um, and We've had some things come through and then what we'll do is sometimes generally I, I, I uh, see something so something will come to mind or Brian will send through some music and an image will come to mind and we discuss it sometimes nothing comes and they think oh god this is not good so I have a conversation with B and he's like oh wow yeah I never thought of that we start looking at music it's I didn't realize how broad um much broader things can be when you have when you're working with somebody and, and the other inspirations because he's not seeing what I'm seeing and he, yet he's creating as well does that make any sense or we've had we have these long discussions about um symbolisms and things that are working within the image itself um a lot of music and um, yeah, a lot of back and forth, because generally I usually just 
do my own artwork so therefore you're just working to whatever comes through for you um, and it's very different working with somebody but it's been really in inspirational it's been really good when uh, Brian comes back and says um, you know look at it this way it's like oh wow I never thought of that that's really um, really an eye-opener yeah if I've missed anything B yeah I think it's um, what I what is fantastic is I think we have this freedom to go back and forth try it have a laugh about it and sometimes our conversations go way off onto different stuff <laughs> and, uh, I find it quite, it goes way off inspirational because we don't know what we don't know and and stuff just comes up you know and you get inspired by what we see or a tv program or just walking down the street um i remember uh, jane and i will go to the uh, jane introduced me to go into the tapes and just looking at the pictures and yeah i mean it's, it's amazing where you can kind of get inspiration from and i think having a laugh having fun with it and having joy with it is just a great blessing i think I've learned a lot just listening listening to Jane and Thomas today. Obviously, I speak to you a lot more, B, but I'm always learning, absolutely. And when I first met you after a long period, and I think I said this to Thomas as well, I hadn't done any art. I hadn't done any. And just listening to Thomas talking, I would avoid people because they would ask, oh, so what have you been doing? I've been doing nothing. I've been doing zero so disconnected and I felt disconnected with myself because my art is my expression of who I am where I'm at and I just did nothing so I would literally avoid people I would avoid people asking me you know so what are you doing because I haven't done anything for so long or oh, so you know and I totally understood so what have you done today it's like well I've done nothing so I met with Brian I think you were back just for a quick period and Brian had said to me just start Annie just start and I think that was my biggest problem starting was you know in my head I had this thing you know yes but I've done that before but that was then what are you doing now and then I got uh, started to do it and then Brian kept talking about looking for an artist to do his illustrations. It never, ever, ever occurred to me because in my head it was telling me, well, you don't, you don't illustrate, you don't draw, you don't have any of that, um, you know, those qualities. And then I uh, was drawing a portrait um, of my very good friend. And by accident, I WhatsApped it to, to Brian and he just said, oh, Annie, I've been looking for an artist. And I said, Brian, do you know what? I never, ever, ever wanted to put myself forward for that because I kept telling myself, you can't do that. That's what the voice, because I hadn't been creative for so long, yet that is what I needed to get back into it, you know? So now I can say, and this is awful because now I can say, yeah, I'm working with Brian now, you know, I'm doing illustrations, but why couldn't I stand up and say, well, you know what, I'm, I'm actually, I felt fear, I felt ashamed, and I felt really um, lesser of a person because I wasn't being creative and I couldn't face people to say, well, you know what, I haven't done any for years. I think I did say that, to, I had told Thomas that and I had said it to Brian, you know, and I felt, you know, I felt ashamed. I really felt ashamed that I hadn't, I hadn't even tried to, but listening to yourselves, I still took pictures, you know, I still was inspired when I saw magazines or, you know, I still collected, I just didn't draw, I didn't paint. I didn't physically do anything. So I'm so grateful for this opportunity with Brian, even if um, 
it's just taking us on a journey and it's really given me back my creativity and it's so lovely to have this opportunity to speak to Thomas and to you Jane because it's all just inter you know we're all interlinked so yeah thank you for sharing and for being thank you yeah and perhaps things come to you when they're meant to come to you you know that break that you had from your art you were probably still creating but um but in a different way or maybe you were just building up all of those ideas maybe or it come out to meet brian yeah maybe i think a lot of it felt that i was hiding and um yeah and it just built it's like depression it just builds you know and you get more ashamed of yourself you get more um you don't want people to you know you start avoiding people it sounds really ridiculous now but that is you know and that went on for a good 10 years that's that's a 10 year period of not same really here i think it people. sounds like an artist <laughs> yeah. Yeah. The, the pain of being <laughs> creative you know the, the, and that's you know what Thomas, you say that and i just think i don't want to sound like that and that's so yeah. awful but that's yeah, what but I sound like. You're saying it's, <laughs> it's good, I think. It's good. I'm sacrificing myself for my creativity. <laughs> <laughs> Do you guys are you guys um familiar with well I know Ram is familiar with spiritual <laughs> teachings or teachers and but there, there, there was this man that I really like. His, his, his name was Jean Klein. And I think someone, a writer, an artist, once asked him a question about writing. And that stuck to me. And I always see that as some kind of a compass. He said, how, how, would, how shall I go about writing? And I mean, the... the Jean Klein wasn't a writer, but I, I liked his response anyway because he said that whatever you do, that when you're happy doing it, it's impersonal. So when you go and do something like playing football or tennis or anything, you're not, you don't have this kind of, well, maybe you will get some kind of ambition to win or, but if you're happy, you know, you're just enjoying yourself. It's so free mm. and there is no mistake anywhere because it's just happening as it's supposed to. And even if you never win a match and you're happy, you've succeeded and it will be contagious to anybody playing with you. It will be fun. I think that's more important than having a score, first of all, and, and a good score. And I think that when writing, it's the same if I'm not enjoying it, then I, why am I doing it? You know, it's, it's, so if I, if I'm not enjoying it, then I re then often I notice it's because I, I have expectations. I have demands on myself, on the way it's supposed to be, um, that it has a certain quality, which I only have from comparison to, I don't know, reading Dostoevsky or who, whoever, you know, who, and that that I think is I think the comparison then it becomes personal it's because then it's about me not become not embarrassing myself. I cannot embarrass myself with this. I cannot show this to anybody because it's embarrassing. The funny thing is throughout my life I felt like that so often about things. And then later on <laughs> I saw people doing almost exactly the same thing that I found too embarrassing to do and they were successful with it and then I felt well they're of course because they're just me in a way it's the same they're, they're not we're not different so no matter how accomplished an artist may be or how great a work of art may be um, to say that I cannot do it then I'm already being personal and I'm already thinking ahead of my, myself. And if I'm just open and I say, I don't know, I don't even know what's going to happen. 
then I'm in the in this impersonal mode where as I said, you know, first I write down the bullshit, which is the personal stuff. And then after a while, it opens up and it becomes impersonal. I have no more agenda with it. It's just, it's not my problem anymore. <laughs> it just does it, its its own thing. Yeah. Yeah, it's doing, it's, it's, it's creating for the joy of creating rather than creating for that end product isn't it yes um and as soon as you start knowing where you're going to end that 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 process in in the middle is not enjoyable because it it, as you said right at the beginning it doesn't take you where you you want to go or where naturally it would send you so yeah 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 no absolutely um yeah just starting and just and it's about the fear blocking you, isn't it? But it's always the fear of others' um, judgment rather than just the joy of doing and expressing. And, and, and I suppose you're talking about the football or talking about um, the art that you would do, but you were embarrassed to do, but others have done. It's, it's also then about different people different characters isn't it um and and going back to the football some footballers will make it to the top not necessarily because they're better than somebody else but just because of their nature their character and 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 perhaps it's the it's the artist with the um harder shells (laughs) or i i don't know but i i agree with you we're all scared aren't we of what other people might think of our work because actually it comes from the heart, doesn't it? <laughs> it comes from our soul. So um, you have to be very brave to open yourself up to, to that. And writing as well. I, I was listening to something um, the other day where, um, you know, writers and their editors, and it's such a, a relationship of trust Um, the editor has to be critical but to you have to have built up such a level of trust where the author then whose work it is knows that that is the truth that someone's speaking you know and and that's their baby being um, judged and and criticized and to take that criticism on board and you do it's a you have to open yourself up and be very brave, I think, as an artist in any in any sphere, writing, poetry. I mean, Brian, with your po- poems and standing up on the, on the stage and, and saying your words, that took a lot of bravery. Hmm. Yeah, um, that was a, that was a 20, 30-year, 40-year journey. I mean, just from the beginning when, as a child, I I had a stammer and just the thought of being on stage was just not even possible. Um, Yes, and then, you know, I got taught this lesson by a six-year-old. And one day I was in class, I was doing the register and this child said, uh, he goes, Mr. Brian, what would you do if you could um, do anything? I was like, wow. Because he said, I would, I would fly, I would fly into space and you know, travel the universe and go to galaxies. So what would you do? Mm-hmm. And I remembered this thought of wanting to do some acting. But the only reason I hadn't was just the fear I had at the time of, especially when I was young, of getting out in front of people. And um, so that held me back for quite a long time. So being able to go, go through that and learn that sometimes when you put your work out there, you express it, you push it out. The audience wants you to do well because they want to enjoy it as well 
And also you learn so much just doing it. You learn so much about um, how to present and, and you get an instant feedback. So I think they're kind of, so you get so much learning by just being in the moment. And yeah, so, and just doing the uh, poetry, being on stage, um, it was terrifying. <laughs> <laughs> but coming off it was fantastic you know fantastic mm. and does that feeling do you keep that feeling in your memory which spurs you on but now it's a bit different because there's is a joy with kind of expressing things now mm. and sharing. So I really enjoy that. And um, yeah, and even what we're doing right now, where we can share with each other, learn things. Um, Annie talked about the fear of doing something. You talked about that, that, that project in 2020 and it took so long and Thomas speaks. It's just great to have these conversations with people and you get inspired by other people. And I'm taking a few mental notes right now about things to do and just to be able to express yourself as well. So just these things as well. And I guess this is a kind of art as well. We're kind of creating right now. We don't know what will come up because there was an idea I had at the beginning, but just forget the idea and just go where the conversation goes. And I really enjoy that. And I think the key is, isn't it, is just do, just do it. And the more you do it, the more you're inspired to do it, the more you want to do it. And it just keeps, keeps going. Yeah. Thomas, could you tell us about, because we were talking the other day that you were up in the mountains. How does um, being in nature and going up there influence your creativity? Ah, yeah. That's the biggest. <laughs> I don't know why I didn't even think of that. But it's when I don't go out for a day, I already feel there's a big difference i am lucky right now that i live here in austria and i can just go out my door and i'm in the forest and in the, in the mountains and and i think that i used to live in a city but i was always dreaming of living like this <laughs> now i'm going back to the city but it, it'll be okay latvia is small and there's a lot of forest but um it's yeah, there's an instant change of my noise. The noise in the body, which is like the way I'm feeling stiff or anything, even my, things I don't notice. There's a difference in my attention because when I'm out there and I leave my phone at home, I, I cannot, I'm not bringing my phone with me unless there's some kind of good use for it. And I'm out with my dog and I, everything is spacious, open, fresh air, calm, quiet, beautiful. And there's, this is, I think the playground for me because it's like watching a live movie that is a lot, a lot slower than these, brain zapping movies on the screen but there's constant surprises I never know what's going to happen when suddenly a ray of light comes out through the cloud or a bird passes in front of you or anything and also just this feeling completely connected with everything again it, it adds it takes away all this personal stuff and 
makes everything impersonal and more inclusive in, in the quality of how I feel. It slows down the thinking. Um, it's good for the body <laughs> as well. Um, and then I feel fresh. And when I feel fresh and then I want to do something, it, it usually, I have unlimited energy. The more I'm out there, the more energy I have for anything and it won't. But if I'm stagnating in a way that I don't go out into nature or for walks, for me anyway, it's then, then I, then I don't have this clarity to, to go fishing because then it's all waves and shaky and insecure. But when I'm out and I have this, I have two friends that are also doing medit having a meditation group in Vienna. One of them actually was a, a friend of Jean Klein who I mentioned earlier. And they go hiking every weekend and invite me and we go into the mountains and there is a beauty in the mountains for me anyway, that's, yeah. Recently I've discovered an artist I'd never heard about. His name is Nicola was, uh, Nicholas Röhrig. He was a Russian artist who wrote books that are kind of spiritual, but he was a painter. And all the book covers are his paintings and they are really amazing. Um, they're paintings of the Himalayan mountains, of different kinds of mountains in Switzerland. Um, kind of a little bit like these Japanese paintings that accentuate nature over the, the human or like the big picture kind of like it's very spacious and open you just have these mountains and clouds and little lines of trees maybe or a building so it's to me it's like going out into nature is connecting with the most essential thing in my human experience for me and it fuels everything not just art also my relationships with people everything i feel it's it's greatly improved when i take care of myself in that way that i allow myself to just enjoy this beauty without needing to go anywhere else which is not always easy, of course, when things get busy, but then. But it's also, I suppose, you, you, you and I do that as well, leave the mobile phone, leave all those connections so that actually you are present in nature at all times. So you can experience it without having any interference. Um, but it's just pure, isn't it? Your experience in nature. Yeah. And also I, I do things because this is a thing that was also important for me. It's like a whole package. I, I'm into meditation and seeing. And there was this man, I'll mention him now, Douglas Harding. He, he wrote these books on, there's a book called Zen or, or the rediscovery of the obvious. And it's just to tune in with what's really there, what's there right now. And I drop all my mental assumptions about the world and everything. And when I see in that way, I, I, I feel like then I see with an artist's eye or with a creative eye because when I just walk and I'm in my normal mode where I'm just a human being doing my thing, I don't pay attention to what's around me. And I think I know what's around me anyway already. So I, 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 I ignore so many things that are happening around me that are literally there in my field of vision. Mm -hmm. 
But when I kind of tune in, and this happens in my nature walks, I do that, I practice that. I just, I am just seeing, like I am the seeing. I have no opinions about anything. And then I see things like when I'm walking and here in where I live, there are these hills, you know. You can sometimes look, you, you can hear where I live, there's all these hills, but quite large. And there's a highway down there and the highway runs and you can see it runs. And then there's a motor station in the distance with these neon lights. You can see that in the midst of this green scenery, there's this flashy one little uh, Las Vegas thing, you know, <laughs> and in this valley. And if I see it just as I described now, then yes, it's, there's a motorway, there's this thing in the distance, there are hills. But when I can just completely drop all that and just be with that, whatever it is, then I have had this experience where I suddenly see the cars are just floating in the hills and in the clouds, you know? And it's like this kind of thing. It's just, I'm removing, because that's actually what I saw. It's yeah. not what I thought I yeah. saw that yeah, mattered. Yeah. It's what I actually saw. And yeah. I saw a, a car in a cloud. Yeah. You know, <laughs> this kind of thing. Well, that's what you're taught when you, you, you're taught to draw, isn't it? Don't draw what you think, you, you draw what you see, not what, yes. you, not what you know is there, but yes. what you actually see. It's that same, f forget all your knowledge <laughs> yeah. and just be their presence at the time. Yeah, that's... I always feel a similar when I see a two-year-old or a one-year-old and they are amazed by one thing and they're focusing and they're finding joy in something that is so ordinary you wouldn't even look at it anymore because you you know it's there whether you see it or not you know, every day you walk past the same thing and here's this child who finds joy just that naive joy in this thing and you you're able to kind of refine that <laughs> as an adult you, you see it again for its beauty rather than it's just an, an ordinary object or an ordinary scene um, so I love that when I see the young children <laughs> and their their joy in the uh, the, their surroundings that we take take for granted and I look at it differently yeah yeah my nephew he's three years old and he with him I get that all the time I see like everything he, he, he for me is it I feel honored because I'm with, with a genius yeah you know yeah. and uh and I remember that because a child doesn't see itself, it only sees the world. It doesn't see itself as a child and body. It just see it just has this picture there. Mm -hmm. It's not concerned with being a person. And um, my brother said to his son, you know, "Oh, you're so little, aren't you? You're so small." And then he said, "I'm not small." And, and then my brother was laughing because he thought it was like, I'm not small, but actually he was saying the truth. Mm -hmm. And so I said to my nephew, that's right. You, you're bigger than all of us, aren't you? And then he said, yes, because to him, that was obvious, mm -hmm. you know, and it made me so, it made me so happy to, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. to, to see that and acknowledge that. And, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. It is. It's that he doesn't even have, he hasn't yet learned to have any kind of conclusions about what all this is. Yeah. So he's completely open and constantly discovering things that I'm not even seeing. Yeah. But I have to work hard to drop on the things that I think I know to see. And in my cre creative process, I feel lucky when I get a moment when I see like a car and floating in the clouds because I know, oh, you know, there's something interesting yeah. at last. 
Well, they haven't mm. got fences. They're not sort of corralled in. Their imagination, they don't have to fit into what they think something should be. And, and I remember years ago with my daughter, we did, um, we did a pottery week um, and it was parents and children and all the parents, I think I might have made a pair, it might have been a very realistic pair, um, but compared to the children, what they, they weren't scared to use this new medium, they just embraced it, they weren't worried that maybe it would explode in the kiln because that didn't really mean anything to them, they just created and they all created the, the most beautiful pieces of art, completely, completely eccentric to us, but that's us, that, that's putting, you know, all our fences back round. And I was thinking of that yesterday um, when I saw my pair and, and I saw what my daughter had created. And I thought, well, why can't we just keep that child, child's imagination? you know, and <laughs> not conform, <laughs> you yeah. know, just, just, just go with it. Thank you all today for joining in. I thought it was a wonderful conversation and I learned so much uh, just by listening to you all. So, um, thank you, Annie. Thank you. Thank you, Jane. Thank, thank you, you Jane. Thank you. It's lovely to meet you all. And thank you for today's special guest, Thomas, in Austria. Thank, thank you. you so it's lovely to really see you. so nice to meet you. And thank you, anybody who's listening to Conversations on Art. Thank you very much. Goodbye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye.